So now we look at what is the user identity. Identity. So who are you? Who 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 who? So you want to find out the you, you who? How does the network know who you are? So what is your identity? Before we get into what is your identity, there are two kind of things that I do want to say who you're not in the network. It's the network doesn't know you by your phone number. So you may be thinking, hey, I've got a phone number. It's plus one, three, one, two, X, three, one, two, four, 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 four. And that's the way the network knows you. No, it doesn't kind of know you by your phone number and actually if you look at it LTE is an IP data connectivity it doesn't need your phone number really for forwarding your messages to and fro also it doesn't need know you by your mobile identity that's the identity or what's called the international mobile equipment identity that's the identity of your phone for example if you press the magic code star pound zero six pound It'll tell you what your mobile identity is, the identity of your physical device. Um, and that's also not the identity used by the network to know you. So who you really are in the network or how the network knows you is by something called the IMSI, is the International Mobile Subscriber Identity. And this is the identity in your SIM card. That's why you need to have your SIM card. And this identity is stored in your SIM card, which is put into your phone. And also all your subscription data in the operator's network in this HSS system, which is this big database that contains your, your subscription information, is based on your IMSI. So let's look at how, what is the format of this IMSI. Um, so luckily, uh, we only have phones so far only in this world, so we don't need to differentiate the Earth from the rest of the world. Um, but inside the world, we need to differentiate the various countries that are there. And for that, we have three digits which are used to differentiate countries. And for that, they are called the mobile country code. So that's the first part of the IMSI that tells you which country you're belonging to. So for example, I'm located here in Turkey. So the first three digits of my IMSI are going to be 286. Now, when I come from 286, the next thing that, uh, that is needed or used in the IMSI is who is my operator or what is my mobile network code. In Turkey, there are three different operators, Turkcell, Vodafone, and Avaya. And, uh, for example, if I have a subscription from Vodafone, the next two digits would be 02. So with digits 28602, I have come down to the operator in my country. And these two things together, the mobile country code and mobile network code, are what's called the PLMN ID. This is also the identity of your subscribe of your operator, and um, and this is kind of important, and this is uh, something that that we will be seeing quite a lot, and people do use this term uh, quite a bit in the specifications called the PLMN ID or what's your operator identity. So it's nothing but your MCC plus MNC, which is uh, which uniquely identifies your operator. Now. From the uh, Vodafone network, you have a large number of subscribers. And then the last part of your IMSI is called the MSIN, which is your mobile subscriber identification number. This is nine to 10 digits. And you overall have 15 digits which form your IMSI. The first two parts of it, MCC and MNC, are your operator identity and the next part of it is uniquely identifying you so so if you happen to be alper you would have 28602 and then another nine or, or ten digits after that and that identity is stored in the um, in your sim card now let's look at how this identities are used and how the plumbing how we how those various tunnels are set up uh, in this network, what we are considering are we have a base station, MME, serving gateway, P gateway. Each of these has IP addresses and they are all communicable via IP connectivity. And of course, HSS also can will have an IP address and which is IP HSS. And for the sake of simplicity, you can assume that they are all connected to a switch. 
um, and they are all able to communicate with each other and um, through the switch. Uh, this obviously is going to be a routable network, but uh, we don't care about that. The main idea here is that they are able to communicate with each other. Um, now in comes this mobile and as we said we are calling mobile as Mehmet. So Mehmet comes in, he's got a SIM card uh, and, and Mehmet, the user equipment is what we call, uh, is, is the term used for a mobile in the specification which includes your phone along with your SIM as we had covered in the previous lecture. And Mehmet comes into the network, uh, but before Mehmet comes into the network, one important thing to know is that between the E node B and the MME, there is a long-term connection, which is this S1 MME interface, and there is a connection set up, uh, which is runs over a protocol called SCTP, which is kind of similar to TCP, but so for all you, you care about is that there is a kind of a socket connection between your E node B and your MME, which is uh, uh, which, which has been set up uh, and, and is a long-term connection, which always exists between all E node Bs and MME uh, in, in the network. So now Mehmet comes in and when Mehmet comes in, the first thing Mehmet attaches communicates with the base station and Mehmet doesn't really tell the base station it's IMSI and we will for security reasons the base station sits out there in the field and can be easily hacked and you don't want some, a hacker sitting in your base station to know whether Mehmet has come in and attached and obviously with it's the president or the prime minister that's even more dangerous so so when Mehmet attaches to the network uh, talks to the E node B, E node B gives Mehmet a temporary identity which in the specification terms is called CRNTI or Cell Radio Network Temporary Identity and I apologize that uh, in specifications we use uh, complicated terms but this is a temporary identity given by the base station and it is valid in the cell or in the, um, in the connection which in the connection between the, the E node B and the UE. And this identity is provided by uh, the base station and given uh, to Mehmet. So Mehmet came in, but E node B basically just says, okay, I call you Ashok. So Ashok happens to be the CRNTI, and he's going to use Ashok for communicating with, uh, with Mehmet o over this air interface. And, and it sets up a signaling radio bearer, it sets up a kind of a, a, a connection, which is the signaling radio bearer zero. And in the meantime of setting up this temporary identity, it also connects, sets up the second logical connection, uh, which is called SRB1. And in the um, slides or in the video of uh, the radio primer, we'll cover a little bit about where some of these signaling messages go. Uh, but at the moment, just look, take, it, take, take this to be just logical connections between the mobile and the base station. And once these two signaling connections are set up, that's when Mehmet is ready to say, I want to attach to the network. That means please register me to the network and I want to get an IP address at the end. But there's, a, there's some more things to be happening before the IP address comes in. So he sends in two messages. One is an attach request saying, hey, I want to attach to the network. And then there is also a separate message which is called TDN connection request, packet data network connection request, saying that please set up the user plane for me so that I can communicate out to the internet, which is somewhere out here. And you would be wondering why do we have two messages and why not just one message which is attached and that will also set up the user plane connection all the way uh, so that the a packet coming in can come all the way from the internet through the P gateway onto the mobile. And that's where we will cover the difference between mobility management and session management. Um, so wait for, wait for those slides to come in. But uh, at the moment, Mehmet comes in, attaches, says, I want an attached request and sends these two messages. These two messages are sent over signaling radio bearer one and they come arrive at the base station. 
And when these messages come in, these are called, these are messages which need to be sent to the MME. The, the mobile doesn't talk with the, for connecting, sends a, sends a message which it says it actually should be going all the way to the MME. So when these messages come here at the base station, the base station says, aha, I need to forward these messages to the MME. And actually the base station is not allowed or not expected to look inside these messages. So for, for the base station, these are just some opaque objects, uh, opaque messages that it, that it needs to just forward along to the MMA. And in order to do that, he says, oh, for Ashok, here is a message. Now I need to send it over to MME, but I will create a identity, a temporary identity for this connection that that I will provide to this mobile and it is called uh, e node b ue s1 apid so it says I will tell the base station I will tell the MME that if you want to ever communicate for this specific ue for which I am passing these two messages and I don't know the identity you you when you send me a message send it to this particular e node b s1 apid for example this is just a number so he says if you want to send any messages for uh, this guy whose identity is mc which i don't know so which happens to be mehmet send me a message saying this message is for four and that is what's the e node b U ues1 ap identity and it so it creates a temporary identity which is used only over this S1 interface and says this is this is what the identity I will use and it forwards these two messages saying that this is the temporary identity for that I have created and if you ever want to send any messages for this particular user uh, send it by using this temporary identity for and, and keep this in mind because this concept of creating a temporary identity for a connection is used over and over in, uh, in, in the LTE system or the Evolve Packet Core system. Uh, so this message is, is being sent uh, by the E node B to the base, by the E node B to the MME and he forwards these messages and these messages now come to the MME. And when these messages come to the MME, the MME can read these messages um, and it looks at it and says, oh, here is the IMZ. So in this way, the UE provides its IMZ to the MME and the MME has the IMZ says, okay, this is Mehmet. And now for Mehmet, uh, the E node V has told me that the connection to which if I ever want to talk to the E node B for Mehmet, I need to send it to this E node B IP address because there are multiple base stations that are connected to uh, this MME and, and, they can to, and they can select the same number four. So in order to differentiate Mehmet from between one base station and another base station, it's a concatenation of the E node B IP address or E node B identity along with the identity that the E node B provided which was the number four. So MME goes ahead and says that okay on the S1 interface if I ever need to communicate with this user I'm going to use uh, use this identity for, for Mehmet. And then it essentially uh, talks then communicates with the HSS to authenticate the, the user and to try to get uh, uh, get parameters for authenticating the user and when it communicates it essentially provides the IMSI to the HSS so the IMSI, so the HSS also has the IMSI of the user and it will return back some of the uh, messages that are used for authenticated authenticating the user which in some of the later slides we will take a look at. So now uh, some keys do come back from the HSS for this user to the MME and the MME now needs to send a message to the mobile through the E node B for authenticating the, the, the user. In order to send this message, MME does exactly the same trick as what um, the E node B had, 
had done. So what MME does, it, it creates a temporary identity to be used over this S1 AP S1 interface using S1 application protocol and he provides a temporary identity and in this slides we will just keep increasing the number by 10. So he says hey e -Node B, if you ever want to send any messages for this user you send those messages with a destination uh, S1 AP identity of 14 and that would mean to me would mean that you are communicating for Mehmet. And so in the next message that he needs, he sends the MME sends down to authenticate the user, which is called the uh, uh, SMC, the security mode command. Uh, it says that this security mode command message is coming from TEID 14 destined to 4. So this and, and he sends it down to this E node B because it knows the E node B I, uh, IP address. And when this message comes down to the E node B, it knows that the, oh this number is 4, so it is for Ashok, for whom I had set up this CRMTI. And for, for Ashok, which I'm using over the air interface, on the S1 interface, the information or the identifier for um, Ashok is this IP address of MME along with the S, the MME uh, UES1 APID, which is 14. So it sets up its context uh, for Mehmet saying that uh, over the S1 interface, this is the identity that he's going to use. And then he forwards this message now over to uh, Mehmet and he will use the CRMTI of Mehmet, as we said, which was called it Ashok. So he says, hey Ashok, here is a message for you and it is coming from your favorite MME. And this message makes it over to uh, Mehmet and Mehmet says, oh, okay, here is, it's, it's addressed to me because it uh, is able to coordinate the CRNTI over here. And then it goes ahead and, uh, and processes the message. And let's assume that the authentication is successful. And once the authentication is successful, what's set up is the uh, logical connection, which is called SRB2, signaling radio bearer two, which is, uh, essentially means that, that messages can be authenticated and uh, can be encrypted and also integrity protected. Encryption means that you are uh, encrypting a message so that nobody else other than the E node B can uh, decode the messages and for NAS messages nobody other than the MME can decode the NAS messages so that's encryption. And then integrity protection is that if there is a bad guy somewhere in the middle over here, he cannot change the bits of the message. And if he changes the bits of the message, um, the other end to, to whom I'm communicating with, that means, for example, the E node B is able to figure out that, hey, there was a bad guy in the middle and he changed $100 to $1,000 and hence I will not accept this message. So that's called integrity protection. So that enables a message not to be tampered by a bad guy in the middle of the of the network. We will cover some more of the security concepts in the in the security slides. Um, and in order to, so so now we have the connection set up over uh, the radio interface. But now let's look at the connection that needs to be set up over uh, the MME and the serving gateway. And then we we said we have a GTPC connection between the MME and the serving gateway and we have a separate GTPC connection for each mobile and just like we had covered in this in the case over the S1 MME interface what this MME will do will be is to create a temporary identity and say hey for for this UE that I'm going to communicate to you, for which I'm going to se send a message which is called a create session request. So CS, since it couldn't fit in here, is, is create session request. So he says here is a create session request coming um, from, for a mobile and he, increase, he includes the IMZ over here. He provides also uh, the MME S1 TEID which is similar to, uh, to, to kind of uh, an identity that a random, not a random number, a number that creates and associates with 
um, with this Imzi with Mehmet and says, if you ever want to send any message which is uh, which is for Mehmet, send it send it using this identity. And for example, we just we just in this in, in, in these slides as we said this number happens to be 24 and he says okay here is 24 and it's for this MZ so please create a session for it and it also says not only and here is the P gateway here is the packet gateway to whom you should communicate with and I also want you to set up a user plane tunnel so it's not only this GTPC tunnel communication tunnel which is going to be set up but also a user plane tunnel that the serving gateway should set up and it goes ahead and sends this service request message to the S gateway when the S gateway gets this message, essentially from this message, it gets the IMZ, and this way the IMZ has been sent to the service, uh, to the S gateway, and the S gateway then stores that for this IMZ on this S11 interface between the S gateway, the TEID to if, which I need to use in order to send any message to the MME is 24, and the MME for this, uh, user for Mehmet is MME1 and uh, tunnel identifier 24. These two together, the IP address and the tunnel identifier together are what's called the FTEID, which is the full TEID, uh, which is the IP address plus the identifier and stage three people uh, lovingly call this full TEID by another name, which we will not cover <laughs> at this moment over here. Um, so it, it goes ahead and says that for, for this, for Mehmet, I've got the, on the S11 interface, um, the, the full TID is the MME1's IP address and, 20, and 24, which is the one which he sent. And once he sees this message, it knows that it needs to set up a, a signaling connection between the P gateway, and, between the S gateway and the P gateway, and also user plane connection for sending down the IP packets because that was uh, that was requested in the message coming from the MME. And in order to do that, the S gateway does this exactly the same trick as we had seen the E node B doing, the MME doing, and now the S gateway says, hey, hey, P gateway, if you ever want to communicate for this user with me, uh, on the control plane, this is the TEID which you will use, and on the user plane, this is the TEID you will use. So if you send me a message, uh, an IP tunnel packet, the TEID that you should be using is this TEID. And for any signaling messages that you will send, you will use this particular TEID. So he uses these two TEIDs, and then, he, then the S gateway goes ahead and adds these two TEIDs um, in the message and sends it down to the P gateway and this message makes it to the P gateway there is the IMSI in here so in this case you can see that the IMSI has made its way to the P gateway and also for this IMSI the the P gateway knows that on the S5 interface so which is this is the S5 interface um, for the user plane uh, this is the TEID which I will use, which we kind of over here said that this value was 24. And for the control plane also, it is 24, but obviously control plane protocol uses another port number. And so you can differentiate these two because these are on two different port numbers and that is covered in the GTPU primer that we have. So, so uh, essentially when this create session request message has made its way to the P gateway, the P gateway has gone ahead and set up this context uh, for the user. And now essentially it's, it processes the messages and says, okay, yes, I do set up this tunnel, I accept it, but hey, it now creates two separate identities uh, so that when a serving gateway needs to send any message for this mobile a control plane message, it should send it to this particular TEID. And for any uplink IP packets, the TEID to be used should be this P gateway S5 TEID. Of course, along with the IP address of the P gateway, because there can be multiple P gateways in the network. And 
and then it after having allocated these two identifiers it it's creates a response called the create session response and it provides these two TIDs and sends it back to the S gateway and the response makes it to the S gateway and the, and the way the S gateway knows that this packet is actually this message is actually for uh, for Mehmet the IMZ is not included here is because this message will be sent to this TEID that was provided by the serving gateway and and sent which was 24 so since it's coming with the TEID destination TEID of 24 serving gateway knows that this message is for Mehmet it goes ahead processes the, me the message and stores the context for uh, in, in the context data for Mehmet's information says that if I ever want to send any control plane messages to the P gateway I will use 34 which was the uh, uh, the T the tunnel identifier for the control for both the user plane and the control plane so uh, so it goes ahead and stores that information and now it needs to send a response to the uh, MME but in the meantime it before sending a response what it also needs to do is that it needs to provide the TEID for this E node B tunnel that needs to be created so he allocates a TEID which essentially the E node B should use for sending any uplink packets uh, for Mehmet and the whole reason for all these identifiers are that these are temporary identifiers that are used to identify packets which are for Mehmet without using IMZ in all the packets or some kind of a permanent identifier. So these identifiers are temporary on each of these interfaces for, for identifying messages that are belonging to, um, to, to, to Mehmet over here. So he, so essentially, we were at the point that the serving gateway goes ahead and allocates a TEID for the S1 U tunnel that that should exist between the E node B and the serving gateway, and also for the control plane between the MME, it assigns a TEID for all these messages and it creates a control session response, providing these two identities uh, to the MME, it doesn't provide these other identities because these because it's only the serving gateway that communicates with the P gateway and the MME or the E node B doesn't need to communicate directly with the P gateway. So um, the serving gateway only provides the identity for this GTPC tunnel and also this S1 UT ID and, and, and sends it to MME. And this message, the create session response, uh, goes back to the MME. And how does the MME know that this message is for uh, Mehmet? Well, you tell me and you think about it. Um, uh, the hint is that it should be sent to this TID, which, Me which MME had set aside for Mehmet and provided to, uh, to the serving gateway. And once this message comes in, the MME knows that this message was for uh, was for Mehmet even though it doesn't have an IMZ in here from because the destination TEID in the message is uh, the MMES1 uh, TEID which we said was a number 14 uh, oh was the number 24 so okay so was the number 24 that uh, that it's coming to so it goes ahead and says okay the serving gateway has set aside a number 44 on this GTPC so this this S gateway S11 TID is 44 so it updates the context of uh, of Mehmet and adds that to the context it processes the, the message and now it, what it needs to do is it needs to send and attach accept to uh, the user now as we had said that the number four has been set up over here by the E node B for all of the messages that MME sends on this S1 connection. So what the MME does here is that it sends a message which is called an initial context setup message. And 
in this part, there are two parts in the message. So this part of the message is destined to the E node bay. And there is also another part of the message, which is called the non-access stratum message, which is this attach, accept, and PDN connection, accept, or actually it's called activate default bearer. Uh, this needs to go to the mobile and this part of it needs to go, it needs to be consumed by the E node B itself. And that's how these, these messages are created. So there, there are actually two parts in the message, one destined to the E node B and the other part of it, which is the NAS message, which is destined to the UE. And how does the on this s1 connection it basically says that this is coming from teid 14 which was set aside for mehmet and it is destined to teid 4 which is which was set up by the e node b for mehmet and e node b doesn't know mehmet's identity he knows he calls mehmet as ahmed as sorry as a shock over this air interface we said right Anyway, so this message kind of makes its way down to the E node B and E node B on seeing this identity 4 says that, oh, this is for, for Ashok and then he goes ahead and he knows that he needs to send uh, this part of the message over to Ashok. And in the meantime, it also knows that, okay, for the user plane over here on this S1U, if I ever need to send any IP packets for the user, I will send it using this number 54. So 54 is the tunnel identifier on any of the IP uh, packets that uh, GTPU tunnels that I send, send that the eNodeB sends up to the serving gateway. All right. And um, so as I said over, over there, it kind of sets up its context, says 54, it processes this message, it kind of knows that it needs to send this message over, uh, send, send the parts that uh, had come in, uh, the, the NAS message, the messages that had come in from the MME, it needs to send these two messages, the attach accept and PDN connection accept, actually it's called activate default bearer, but whatever, there are two messages that need to go in and it sends us over, including this in a message which is called RRC connection reconfiguration. So saying, hey, I want to reconfigure this, this connection that I have with you. And the main part of it is I want to add another user plane, a data radio bearer for sending user plane data. And the bearer identity is going to be zero and it also provides a logical identity that will be used over the air interface and that logical identity example we are saying is equal to three. So it goes ahead and sends this RRC connection reconfiguration message to the UE which includes the uh, the messages that are coming from uh, the E node B, the attach accept and uh, PDN connection accept or activate default bearer. And with this message, as we said, because he includes the uh, bearer identity, which are logical identifier, so that creates the, the user plane data radio bearer for, for the mobile. And they're using the logical identity of three over the air interface. And you can guess why this is three, because logical identity zero, one, and two are used for the signaling connection and anything between three to 11, there can be up to eight, eight of these data radio bearers. And you must be wondering, why do we need to have eight? Well, those are more advanced topics and, and, and we'll probably cover them a little bit on the QS uh, uh, lectures where, uh, where a different data radio bearer gets set up for a different, for each different QS. And that's the way uh, LTE is being designed. But at the moment, so we we set we are just setting up one data radio bearer for sending all of users uh, IP packets, and that's typically what your mobile networks today are doing because they're not really doing much of uh, QS for you, unless you are using Volte, in which case you are having multiple data radio bearers. Uh, but let's not complicate uh, our lives at the moment. Um, so this RRC radio reconfiguration request comes in, it sets up a, um, a data radio bearer for the user and this attach accept message comes to the mobile knows that it has been attached 
and also the the, the bearer has been set up so so also this uh, bearer is set up for for the user um, another part that uh, I haven't shown in the message is that in this attach accept message over here actually has an identifier which is called a temporary identifier which is called the GUTI, the globally unique temporary identity. So this identity let's say is John. So what uh, MME is telling the UE is when next time you communicate with me, we will use the code name John and we will not use your permanent identity Mehmet because that identity is sensitive and it and, and the network tries not to send that identity over the radio inter, over this radio interface because there can be bad guys listening over this radio interface to try to get the IMSI. The only time the IMSI is sent uh, in the clear is in the attach message when there, there is no other temporary identity set up for the user. So the uh, the attach accept message has uh, has the temporary has uh, a temporary identity also set up for the user so in this way you can see also from the identities that the permanent identity is imsi which is shared with uh, all these network elements but then there is a temporary identity called guti which is used between the ue and the um, Okay, UE and the MME, and then there is the cell radio network temporary identity, which is used between the UE and the E node B. And then, of course, we saw that on each of these interfaces, there were these other temporary identities that are used for identifying messages uh, for a particular user, and we went through the whole process of how these are ident how these are selected and sent to the other end. Um, at the end of this now the, the, there is still one step which is which is remaining is that and can you guess what that is is the fact that we really haven't identified um, the e node B has to provide this tunnel identifier uh, for this S1U tunnel to the S gateway saying that if you get any downlink packets you should send it to this identifier and that is exactly what the E node B will do. Uh, it goes ahead and sets up this identifier uh, that says that hey serving gateway for any downlink IP packets you should use uh, this tunnel identifier on the GTPU tunnel when you send send packets down, down to me. and. So it goes ahead and after this radio has been set up, it goes ahead and says the initial UE context accept message. It says that for this tunnel over here, this is the identity 64 is the number that you will use, that the serving gateway should use for sending any downlink IP packets. And it sends it to this MME. The MME knows that this message is for uh, is for Mehmet because it's it has the destination um, MME UES1 AP identity as 14 and it goes ahead and processes this this message and then it figures out that it needs to send um, send send uh, update the serving gateway with the uh, S1U temporary identity which is coming from the uh, from the E node B, so it goes ahead and creates a modified bearer request and says that for this uh, bearer identity, uh, <coughs> which is EBID over here, is EPS bearer identity, so which is Evolve Packet System bearer identity. Okay. And it says for the CPS bearer identity, the uh, the tunnel identifier uh, in the downlink direction is 64, which is being provided by the E node B via the MME to you. And when this message comes in, uh, because the fact that this came in to 244, which was the uh, T, which was this. Uh, TEID for this GTPC tunnel that uh, SKT had set aside, it goes ahead and it updates the context of 
the, um, the user and then sends back essentially a message accepting that. Now, so this is the entire plumbing and it's an important figure uh, to, to keep in mind. I know there is a busy figure and, and what you can see here is that, that there is quite a bit of state that gets created for a user, for each user which is stored in the E node B, in the serving gate, in the MME, in the serving gateway and P gateway. Um, one important concept is that this entire user plane all the way to uh, between the P gateway and the S gateway and E node B is called the EPS bearer and this is used um, quite a lot in the specification. So this is an EPS bearer, it consists of a data radio bearer, it consists of an S1U bearer as it's called and it consists of an S5 S5 bearer, S5U bearer, I mean we are, we are talking about the, the this part of it and not not the control plane so this is called an EPS bearer and there is each bearer has an identity and that is called the EPS bearer identity or EBID and for example over here we used an EBID equal to zero so this is the bearer identity zero identifying the bear identifying this bearer this bearer identity is shared all the way between from the UE uh, the E node B, the serving gateway, the P gateway, and the MME also knows this bearer identity. So that's one way of identifying a particular bearer. Uh, another term which does get used in the standard, it's called the RAB or ERAB, which is consisting of the data radio bearer and the S1U bearer. This is called the ERAB or radio access EPS radio access bearer, radio access bearer. So, had my handwriting been better, you would have been able to decipher this easier, but hopefully that's uh, legible enough. So, uh, a radio access bearer consists of a data radio bearer and an S1U bearer. So, these are important terms to keep in mind, uh, ERAB and EPS bearer. EPS bearer is all the way from P gateway to the UE and ERAB is between the UE and uh, the serving uh, and, and the serving gateway.